ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, welcome back to episode 55 of Cutoffs and Coffee. We appreciate y'all tuning in with us today. I am CT. That is James, as always, your co-host for the show. And today we've got a banger for you. We have Miles James Burris on the show. Miles and I met on the film Safety, the Disney Plus film, as he played one of the lead roles. Keller is the name of the role, and, and we talk about it a little bit. Miles has had success in many careers already. He played NFL football for the Oakland Raiders. He is now pursuing acting full-time and is doing an unbelievable job. You'll recognize him from shows like Young Rock, again, movies, like we mentioned, Safety, as well as The Righteous Gemstones on HBO. So we dive into the parallels of sport and acting and, you know, it, both of them being super competitive environments, both of them being places where you've got to show personality and you've got to rise above everybody else you're competing with to to really, truly make a name for yourself. And Miles has done that multiple times on multiple occasions. And we think you're going to take a lot of really good gems out of this one um, and going to enjoy listening to it as much as we enjoyed having the conversation. And this episode is brought to you by Horsepower. Horsepower is a T3 performance class specifically for football players at the middle school level. That class is starting soon. And at the high school level, that class will start as soon as the high school season ends. The Horsepower class is a 90-minute speed, strength, and conditioning class that is perfect for that football player looking to get to the next level. If you want to get jacked like Miles, this is a great place to start. The foundations of strength training, the basic speed principles, Principles that are applied to football are trained on a daily basis with Coach Dale. It is one of our best classes that we offer at T3 Performance. So if you're a football player looking to level up, check us out at Horsepower. You could follow Dale at his Instagram page or check out T3 Performance's Instagram page for updates on when that class is going to be starting. I'm hyped for the Horsepower guys to come back. It's always Dude. always live sessions in the gym over there at T3. Absolutely. If you enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, what we're doing on this show on Cutoffs and Coffee, please share, subscribe, like, comment, send us messages. Let us know who else you want to hear on the podcast. We'll try our best to get on and have great conversations. So like, follow, subscribe, share, do everything you can to help us out, and we appreciate it. So here it is without talking about it anymore. If you guys like pre-workout and like trying to get jacked in bench press, you're going to love this conversation. If you don't like any of those, I'm sure you'll still love it. Here it is, episode 55 with Miles James Burris. Enjoy. If you are watching the YouTube video, James and I request that you guys turn that off immediately because our guest Miles James Burris is here and his delts are filling up the entire screen. Traps are up to his ears and we feel completely demasculated. So, <laughs> Miles, thanks uh, for coming on the show, man. Thanks for wearing the cut. We appreciate having you. How are you, bro? Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I just had to get one little bicep flex in while I was here, just so you guys weren't thinking I was scrawny below frame. And it's just important for everybody to know about it. Yeah. You know, if, if uh, anybody wants to pause this video and go to his Instagram page, you're going to see a pretty decent amount of shirtless bicep, double bicep, <laughs> some of them with blonde hair, which I'm stoked to get in this, you know, this conversation about playing triple H, but uh, yeah, you're going to see exactly what you want from, from miles's Instagram. And I will tell you guys listening that if he's not yet, by the end of this podcast, he will be your girlfriend or fiance or wife's favorite actor. Uh, Get that out right now. So don't be scared, guys who are listening. Maybe kind of listen to it solo. Uh, but let's start off, man, before we dive into all the acting stuff, before we dive into the performance stuff and the football stuff, we want to know a little bit more about you. What can we or what do we need to know about you, Miles, that we can't find from a quick Instagram or Google search? Hmm. Well, I don't know if it's something uh, you need to know about me, but as you, you mentioned, I played Triple H in NBC's Young Rock. But what you don't know is uh, when I was in fifth grade, all my friends, they watched, you know, WWE. And uh, I didn't even know who Triple H was. I didn't really follow a whole lot of the, the wrestlers, but apparently some guy was telling everybody to suck it. You know, he was going, oh, suck it. And I thought that was the coolest thing. I'm like, I don't know what this means, but I am I think that's awesome. It, it feels good. And so I was telling everybody to suck it. So I go up to the playground, I roll up on some older kids. I'm like, hey, what's up, dude? Yeah, suck it. And then they start chasing me. And I'm like, why are they chasing me? And I run around the corner and they eventually catch me and they, uh, they beat me up pretty good. So that was that was fun. Yeah. Um, Look at me now, right? 
Yeah, yeah. So it's I guess it's only fair that I, I get to uh, uh, get paid back, and and people love it when I say suck it now, and they pay me for it. Yeah, that's unbelievable. That the attitude era, man, of the WWE was like an amazing time to be alive. That's mm-hmm. something. That- I have in 55 episodes, I haven't talked about any of that, but like that was very near and dear to my heart. And it was so cool when I got to see, you know, you, you playing that role of Triple H and another buddy, Gavin Rocker, playing the role of Ray yeah. Lewis on, on, on a similar show. And it was just like, that was so cool, man. Um, and I'm sure you got plenty of, plenty of dope stories, but how about a skill also that you're either working on currently and you're always, man, building your skill set, something that you're working on currently or the last skill that you taught yourself? um uh, yeah screenwriting that's not the last skill but it's probably the most important one that i've been teaching myself over the past three years um i've read a a few screenwriting books and just been getting after it so between shoots there's so much downtime and um i wanted to start creating content for me to play characters in the future for stuff that i want to make or screenplays that i want to sell and attach myself to uh so i've written four five screenplays by now and have at least a couple that I think are in, in good shape to start pitching. So that's kind of the next step. What's been the most challenging part about that? Oh man. Um, that it doesn't flow every day. Uh, but you just got to sit down and do it, you know, and, and, um, also not, you know what it's like to, to endeavor in a new, uh, and in, into a new vocation and in a new area, you don't know what you don't know. And so like, I, there's so much that I have to learn. And so there's, it's easier for doubt to creep in because you think, well, I think this is good and it makes me feel something, but what if I put it out there and I realize that, you know, I I'm, you know, at the bottom of the mountain and the standards are way higher than I think. Um, even though I read a ton of screenplays and, you know, I, I read some of the best stuff and, uh, and kind of know what that is, but it's hard to judge yourself because it's just hard to distance yourself from yourself and your own work. And so you don't know what you don't know. And, and that's a little scary, but you just have to, you got to put yourself out there as part of it. Man, that's a great point. We, we ask about non-negotiables, right. With, with a lot of guests, because we see <clears throat> often that high performers have a lot of things throughout the day that are just important to them that they feel like they've got to do each day to continue to kind of like push themselves vertically in their craft. Is that, one of those things that you're saying you got to sit down and write every day, no matter what. Yeah. And it's not even every day right now, but it's, um, I'd say it's, it's like three or four days a week, um, that I'm really pressing into that. And uh, usually I'll have like goals, like, Hey, get to this part of the screenplay by this time or write this many pages or, you know, get this revision done by this point. Um, because I, I did do every day for a long time and I noticed it was, a lot harder to um, disperse my creative energy, especially when I'm on set from like, okay, I'm going to go full in and really focus on this project, get up an extra hour early before set and write this when really I should be, you know, getting into my character more and really focusing on what I have to do on set that day. Um, uh, I I was running into issues with that a little bit. So generally if I just create every day, if I do something creative every day, that's, that's a big piece of it as well point probably have just so much creative bandwidth that yes. eventually that runs out and then you don't want that to run out mid shoot you know mid film yeah. and have to figure out how to recharge that so talked a little bit about the acting um let's hear your story for so for everybody who doesn't know let's you know talk us um through your childhood what it looked like growing up in your into your college and professional football careers and now kind of take us up to where you're at today yeah, so I was born uh, in Sacramento, California, and grew up there, um, just a little outside of the city. <clears throat> I was the youngest in a family of five, so I had an older brother, older sister, and they would get into a little more trouble than I would. Uh, so I was considered the the easy one, and uh, the my older brother, older sister kept my, my parents very, very busy. So I had a lot of solitude kind of growing up. I had a lot of time to myself because they didn't have to worry about me, you know, and so I was um, a big dreamer. Like I grew up on Ninja Turtles and three ninjas and, and uh, GI Joe and transformers and all this, um, the stuff and whenever I could sneak in an Arnold movie or Sylvester Stallone movie and my parents didn't catch me, then that was going to happen too. But, um, 
I've always just been a big dreamer, man. And watching those things, it was like, man, I believed I could beat anybody up after watching Ninja Turtles or watching, you know, three ninjas and these kids, you know, taking on adults. And um, I was pretty creative when I was young, too. I was a big drawer and um, would try to draw like pictures of me when I was growing up and all big. And um, but then I got into it. So the first thing I did, like athletically, I would say was was martial arts. I was so into that because of all of the shows that I was taking in and, you know, uh, I just wanted to be surrounded by it. Uh, but as soon as I picked up a ball and realized like, Hey, I'm getting a good response from people as, you know, athletically in, you know, football and basketball and things like that. Um, you know, I took it, I took it that direction. Um, a kid, when my best friend at the time, he lived down the street from me and there was a park and it was the first year they had a junior uh, football league for uh for our high school connected to our high school so there wasn't anything like that and then all of a sudden I, I go watch my buddy um playing football down at the park and I thought well I gotta give that a try I'm, you know and and uh as soon as the pads rolled on that was it for me I was like this is this football thing I went up st the street to my mom and um and, and called my dad and he was on a business trip I said dad I want to play in the NFL like this is it I love this and they're like yeah okay baby yeah real good and um so I was just laser focused. I couldn't help but just always think about football growing up. You know, I'd had um, ripping out pages of, of football magazines and just plastered all over my wall as a kid. And, um, you know, basically just daydreaming all day at school. I had ADHD, still do. I would just daydream about football and making huge hits and scoring touchdowns. And then I would go and, you know, play football after school with friends at the park. And then I would just play Madden like through for the rest of the day and I would create a player and and think like man and it, what's wild is it was like pretty accurate like I I had a good idea uh of my genetics at the time like my dad was 6'3 and my mom's 5'11 I was like I, I'll probably be you know at least my dad's size so I'm gonna be 6'3 and make my guy 250 uh, I'm, I'm a, I'll probably have the best future as a linebacker so I'm gonna be a linebacker out here <laughs> and uh and, and I was, you know, pretty close to that. I was, you know, arguably 6'3 and 245 pounds when I played. And so um, uh, that was really cool. And I, I still kind of have that um, boyish, like, dreamer way of thinking today. And I think it still serves me really well. Um, so from, from high school, I went to – I got – a bunch of scholarship offers, but I wanted to stay close to home. And uh, Cal was the, was number one for me. I wanted to go to Cal so bad. It was about an hour and a half from, from Sacramento or two. And uh, they didn't offer. And then neither did Fresno state. My best friend went to Fresno state. Um, and uh, I was almost going to go to Nevada, Reno, because that was two hours from my house. And for my trip, it was the first snow of the year. So I looked at my mom and I was like, Hey, I'm going to San Diego state. And, um, and so went over there and we were just awful when I got there. I mean, went in two games, then four games. And then we got a uh, Brady Hoke came in and he brought his staff with him. Um, and they just changed everything around and um, really revitalized the program. They've had winning seasons ever since. Uh, but they brought an awesome strength and conditioning coach with him. His name was Aaron Wellman. And I think he's still the head strength and conditioning coach for the New York Giants. And he, um, the combination of the coaches and Coach Wellman was like, just completely revitalized our program, not only physically, but mentally. Um, it was just basically, you know, we're, we're a bunch of tough SOBs, get in or get out. And so many people got weeded out that first off season. They just weren't willing to put the work in. And it was really, really hard and competitive and just getting after it. Um, and they were really big on teaching us to run to the ball, you know, every single play and run with bad intentions. And the combination of those things is, is definitely why I got drafted. You know, um, there was a that switch mentally that was really important for playing the game and just being a dog. And um, uh, so played really well at San Diego State, got drafted in the fourth round to the Oakland Raiders at the time. Played... Uh, uh, started every game that rookie year at outside linebacker will and then was injured most of my second year third year uh, started every game at Mike linebacker and then injured my knee I injured my knee several times and it injured it again uh, the offseason of 2015 
and right before the draft, so it was that time when they drafted some backers and released me injured. And I, I took about a year to get fully healthy. And then once I did, I took tons of workouts for about the next year. And what basically kept happening was like, Hey, uh, we're going to sign you. And then, you know, um, five minutes later, they'd be like, Oh, we, you know, the, the trainers told us that you're, you, they vetoed it. You were on the list that, you know, to not sign because of, they didn't like your scans essentially. Um, and then the last, the last straw with football was I, I did a mini camp with the Vikings and, um, it, you know, cause I really believed I was meant to go back and, uh, train my butt off and, um, I got there and it was just like day one, my knee blew up like a softball and that it just wasn't the same. And I knew, okay, it's, it's done. Like day one, I knew it wasn't, it just physically wasn't in the cards anymore. Uh, but I finished out the three day camp, but I would just sit there at night in the hotel bed, just like, God, why, why, what, what is going on here? I really believe, man, I'm, I'm meant to get back in this. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, the world's going to see, it. it's going to be this great comeback and this, that, and the other. And, uh, I was just so upset and so exhausted, but I couldn't sleep at the same time. And I'm trying, and just with my eyes closed, I just, in that moment, I, okay, I realized football's done. And that very night, I got this vision, and it's never happened in my life before. and hasn't happened since, but it was like I was watching a movie on the back of my eyelids, but it was just all these memories of me, like, being a goon or making people laugh, um, getting in front of crowds and doing something, you know, just memory, 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 memory. And it was so much more vivid than just like thinking back to those memories. It was weird. Um, and so I just felt like I, I heard God say in that moment, like you're an entertainer, you know? And so I took that as, okay, I guess I'm going to go try this acting thing, you know? And, and because I'd always thought once football's done, I'm going to give that a shot. I want to try that. Um, but I was so upset in that moment you know, because it was like, I really felt like I was meant to play football again. And uh, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't quite trust that in the moment, but I told my wife about it in the sense I was just um, really depressed and, and just kind of sitting on the couch. And um, my wife let me sit there maybe for about a day. And uh, she's like, Hey, get up. We got, we got to start moving. We're going to get you into an acting class. You know, you talked about this acting thing since college, like, let's, let's go try it. You know? And I was like, okay. And so she helped me. She, we were in um, Orange County at the time about, you know, if, if there wasn't traffic an hour from L.A., but probably like two, two and a half. And um, so she got me locked in some acting class, and that's that's where it started. I, I took lessons for a few months. Um, and then I created an actor's access profile. And um, there was a, a breakdown that I think they tried to cast several times, you know, through just representatives and then couldn't quite find the character. And so they released it to Actors Access for, for anybody to kind of submit on. And so I got an audition for that one and, and booked it. And it was like my first ever in-person audition. And um, I didn't know what to expect. They sent me the script like maybe the day before or something. And, um, and so I go drive to set and show up and and they're like all right yeah get dressed real quick and they rush me in to go do rehearsal right away and i'm standing right in front of randall park and some other people that i could recognize but couldn't quite name and then, and it was just this huge set and i'm like wow this is like a it was like a legitimate like big budget pilot production and um and we're going through this scene and i had a weird voice that i gave the character and and uh like randall park immediately like lost it laughing and, and i was it just i came alive immediately and um and we start shooting it and doing it and it was just in that very moment i was uh, football was behind me i was like this is it i want to do this i just i just knew it this is i love this I, I love the um from action to cut and you know um just having to come alive in that moment and perform and uh it was it was in that moment that i you couldn't pay me to go back to playing football i just wanted to do that and, and uh so yeah since then i've just been you know, slowly create momentum and get more and more jobs. And um, uh, let's see, I've, I've, we met on the set of safety. So that was at that point, my biggest, the biggest role that I had one of the leads in the uh, Disney plus film called safety. And, um, and uh, let's see what else I had recurring arcs and 
Lucifer righteous gemstones, and right now I'm going back and forth between shooting uh, Young Rock season three as Triple H and uh, a cartoon adaptation. They're making a live action series called The Loud House, and um, that shoots in New Mexico. So I just got back from that last night, and that's where I am here today, talking to you guys. You know, with our shirts cut off and looking <laughs> like men. Yeah, man. Y- you know, like vision boards. That's what I thought about, right? You you cut these pictures out, and you and and that's super popular thing now. But I did the same thing growing up. You know, I cut out pictures of uh, Peter Wark and um, you know uh, Peyton Manning and all these guys that I looked up to and put them up put them up there. And you almost and then eventually ended up playing professional football, not at your level. But there's a certain uh you know energy of manifestation involved, right? It's like this is the only thing I'm obsessed with this thing. And you get there, right? And you realize that like, oh, this is possible. What else can I do, right? Mm -hmm. How did you take that once you made the transition, right? Okay, I've I've played at the highest level of football. I've played, you know, the feelings you get from running out on the field. Again, we've done it at much different levels. I'm running out in front of 10,000. You're running out in front of, you know, 90 plus thousand. But, you know, what, what did you take from your football career, whether it be work ethic or, you know, anything like that and put it into your acting career that has made you so successful. And so what seems like quickly, right. So even since we met in 2020, two years ago, I feel like every time I go to your Instagram, there's a new video, there's a new picture, a new, new thing that you're working on. What did you take from your football career that has helped you have success now in this next kind of pursuit? Yeah, that's a good question. There's probably a lot of things. Um, and a lot that will come to mind after this conversation, but I would, it's interesting. You're talking about the vision boards and putting your favorite players all over the walls too. Cause I almost think like, do you think part of that is just knowing like it's a reminder of like, that's how high the standard is. And so I have, you know, I have to shoot for the stars and I may get there, but if I don't, you know, I'll still get, I'll still get pretty high. Um, Cause I think there's something to that, like, you know what it's like to jump from high school to college in football and, and, you know, everybody's bigger, faster, stronger college to pros. And, and it's like, you're, everything's moving so fast. You have to learn so many plays. You're having to go on the fly, but you also recognize almost without any language in your head, it's just an understanding that this is the bar. So I have to be at this bar now. And you just, you just get there quickly because you have to, because it's like, I, I have to live this dream. And so, in order to be able to perform with these guys, I have to up my game and it just happens. You know what I mean? Um, I already forgot the question. (laughs) It's like the the connection between the two, right? Because even the very little bit of kind of entertainment work I've done, a lot of times the people who I'm working with will say, and I have gotten picked out in some of these classes and whatnot. It's And CT, it's the same in training and strength training, right? You got to be consistent. You got to do it all the time. You got to always be practicing. Hey, CT, it's the same thing. And when you're, you know, when you're playing a team sport, you've got to work well with others, right? You've got to take direction. And so I mm-hmm. think there's so many complementary traits that are learned in sport that carry over to a lot of really a lot of jobs, but especially that one, right? Because it's so competitive. I think it's another thing that maybe people don't understand. You, you just say, you said it very modestly. Yeah. I just hopped on act- actors access. I booked this role. Like, People do that for years, years, and don't get the opportunity. It's so competitive. You have to be so dialed in, and you've got to be able to give all your focus to this one thing, understanding that it might probably, for the high percentage of people, not not work, right? But you were able to somehow take what you did on the football field and get to the highest level there, and then transition that to another super uber competitive field of acting and are continuing to have success. So I think just being able to blend the two and seeing like the traits, you know, can help some of our listeners kind of make those connections in their lives. Okay. I was a really good baseball player. I'm now done playing baseball. What can I do now? Right. And it sounds like find something you're super passionate about and that you maybe even love more than the original thing and pursue that until you kind of like, you know, until the gas runs out. Yeah, exactly that. So I, what I would always say is like wherever your gifts and talents and abilities collide with your passions and what you love, like go go after those things um, because 
there's so much time in the dark room like with f football you know this there's so much time you spend alone in the film room or on the field running drills or specific movements in the weight room like you have to love that piece of it um and even if you don't love that piece of it if if you love the sport so much or acting so much or whatever like there's just so much time spent by yourself like having to hone your craft and if you have that strong vision of, of what you're trying to become then you you start loving those days even though they're it's a grind and it's hard and um you have to push through but that's that's what keeps you going um and and so i think that it's it is somewhat of an ability to work hard when no one's watching and learning that from sports it carries over in this industry especially as you're getting your career ramped up because you're not on set every day it's it's a, a blessing and an honor to get on set but it doesn't happen super often and so you're having to stay ready for the moment and refine your craft and and work hard at whatever it is you're pushing in on um, in the industry or just whatever it is um and, and you're often doing that alone and i think it's uh it's a great ability when somebody can can grind as hard as they can when nobody's watching and no one will ever know about that work that's a go ahead james and that that's a you know that's a topic that we try and bring up with our middle school kids our high school kids that that we work with is like okay well this end goal is let's say going to college to play baseball right that's what you want to do what do you have to do that you don't want to do that will help you get there and i think the I think the athletes that are willing to go there and do the uncomfortable things that they know i don't want to do this but this will help me become a better baseball player this will help me become a better football player um with with those kind of things like what was that for you when it came to acting and you know making that transition like okay i want to be an entertainer i want to make people laugh what did you have to do that was uncomfortable for you to get to that point? Dude, I asked so many uh, actors that question and nobody would ever give me like a straight response. It's like, how, what, like, what do you guys do? So I just kind of figure I, on my own, like, I guess I just like look up monologues or like scenes online and run them by myself and like put myself on camera and doing this monologue and see, okay, I keep, I don't know why, but I keep looking left and that's distracting. And so, you know, let's, Let's just, you know, keep my eye line here and then try it again. And just kind of like sports, you know, that's um, that's what I knew is like, OK, we're going to watch the the practice film and you watch the mistakes you're making. And then that's how you learn. And then you go apply them and you see yourself get progressively better. Um, I just did that. I put my phone on a tripod and would, would practice monologues every day uh, or scenes. And I would just like just record the other lines and leave space for um me to hear them and then deliver my lines and uh i would read you know scripts and um you know then maybe see how um, the actor played it if i hadn't seen the movie yet and and i would just do yeah just a bunch of stuff like that outside of class because a lot of actors you know i'd ask them and and they give you just the perfect hollywood response of like appeasing you but not giving you any information you know nothing applicable and um, and so I think a lot of actors were really just like going to class once a week, and um, that was about it. Um, so I, I I was doing that, and then I also was uh, joined you know SAG after, and so the SAG after foundation I essentially was like a film school. So I, I didn't have to you know work a job because I had a cushion from football. So I was pretty much almost every day like going to um, just different acting classes and learning every different technique. Um, at the SAG After Foundation um, in LA and, and did that for, for about a year. And that was very immersive and awesome. And um, yeah, yeah, that was, that was mostly it. And now, like, now I'm not, you know, just uh, unless I've got an audition or, you know, I'm, I'm prepping for a role in specific scenes. I'm not really doing that anymore because I found personally um as I'm writing every day I'm playing every character in my head and often like playing them out loud and like how would this banter go blah 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 blah, 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 blah you, know, you know and and that gives me a great understanding of like theme structure and writer's intentions and it's also me practicing my acting at the same time oddly and uh, it's you know two birds one stone and that's been a huge blessing for me too and you talked a little bit about you know, God kind of putting you in these perfect situations, right? <laughs> when we met, you had mentioned on, on on the film safety, 
I actually watched that film with James and his wife and then my now fiance. We were on the couch in his room. We were watching it and loved the film. Um, and a lot of times when you get onto a set, especially a, a sports film, you'll get actors who are very good at that skill. And then they're asked to play athletes and they don't have any background because they've been creative theater types their whole life. Miles Burris walks on film, puts the helmet on, rolls the, you know what I mean? Like Jersey up under his abs and everybody looks around and is like, Oh, this dude's actually like very legit. Right. Then you dive into it and it's like, oh, okay, he played in the NFL played for the Raiders. It makes sense. Was that one of those moments that you realized this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing because I, I get to take not only my skill from playing professional football, but then I get to blend it now with my skill for acting. Um, was that one of those like big moments for you that said like, okay, this is it. This is definitely where, where I need to be. Or was there even something from there that is still that, that has happened more recently. That's kind of had been that light bulb moment that said, yeah, this is, this is exactly what I'm, what I'm meant to be doing. I think I probably had the realization prior you know, like, this is what I, I need to be doing. I love this. Um, and, and, you know, I feel like I'm good at it. I'm getting good feedback. <clears throat> With safety, it was it was awesome. But there was also that that voice in the back of my head that was saying, yeah, I mean, you only book this acting role, though, because you're, you know, a football player and da 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 And I'm trying to be a real actor. And, um, and so there's a little bit of that. Uh, but you also have to understand, like, your type and your look and embrace that. And still, what I'm mostly going out for is, uh, big guys, you know, big, big dudes or athletes, wrestlers, football players, things like that. And, and you learn to embrace it and understand that, um, you know, if you didn't have the craft to go along with it, you wouldn't begin those roles. Right. Was that the most like you that you've played or is a hundred Hearst Helmsley more like you, or is, you know, the, your, your character in righteous gemstones is, is there a character that you look back on <laughs> that maybe somebody who, you know, isn't super familiar with your work yet can watch it and be like, Oh yeah, that's the same guy from the, from the podcast. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think, I don't think any of the characters I've played have been like me uh, in, in, because in safety, I was just, you know, kind of a jerk and come down with a hammer and, and lead, you know, that way, which I, that's never really been me. I've been more lead by example. And I'm always wanting to make sure everybody around me is very comfortable and uh, just, really cater to people's emotions and things. And, and now that you say that, I think about it, like I played this super like party frat guy in Lucifer and like, that's not me. And I wasn't not a jerk, like the guy at safety. Uh, I'm not like triple H really. Uh, yeah. I don't know, man. I don't think I've really played me yet. And I don't think, I don't know if I'm interesting enough to, to put on screen. It's just, like... <laughs> well, that's why you're right. Right. Like, okay. Yeah. Maybe you can develop these characters that are, that are yeah. more similar. Yeah, I, I think I think so. I think um, the niche that I'm going to eventually fall into is more of an an action comedy um, uh, kind of thing. Um, but I think where where I really can kind of pop in people's eyes more is is uh, just being this big guy and not expecting people to think I'm. People don't expect me to be funny or goofy or play against my type, and I'm I'm pretty good at doing that. And so I'm, I've been writing a lot of things that kind of cater to that and and um right now my, my niche is writing kind of comedies with heart you know um and, and especially in the family friendly films I'm, I'm i'm able to i think make things funny for an audience that um you know can get the whole family sitting down and watching and everybody can appreciate it it's funny you say that that character was was nothing like you um quick story from that set we had spent maybe three or four days rehearsing our our scene from halftime and you have this big hit that you come down and, you know, make on, make on one of the other actors and you get up and you scream and flex and you're in charge of this huddle being, being the middle linebacker in the, in the film. And I remember I went home one of those days and uh, I think followed you on Instagram. And one of the first things I saw was you dancing on the Ellen show. <laughs> and then, so the next day you're up there getting coffee, getting stimulated as we like to do. And I go up and do the same thing. And I was like, Hey man, I saw you on the Ellen show. Tell me about that. Right. And you talked me through that, that little story. And that's exactly the same thing. I thought I'd go, this character is nothing like this. Dude. <laughs> like, I think all of us on set working with you is kind of like back up, let him do his thing. You know what I mean? He's big and scary and strong and he's, he's playing this. Role. And then as soon as we cut that, it's 
you're telling jokes, you're dancing, you're having a good time. And that's so cool to see. Um, can you tell us real quick about how that whole Ellen thing um, ended up happening? And, you know, I don't know how far down your Instagram you got to scroll, but I think that was such a, a cool thing to see and such a funny story. I think that would be something for, you know, people would enjoy to, to hear. Yeah, no, it was really a, it was a fun and funny day. I had my sister and mother-in-law visiting um, and, and I can't even remember, I think, my wife figured out like, Oh, you can go to these, these tapings of like the Ellen show or different things. And so we just thought, Oh, that'd be a fun thing for them to do while they're visiting. And so we went and um, they do a really good job. Like before Ellen comes out, like before anything starts shooting of just keeping the energy up. Cause they really want the energy of the crowd to be alive and be really in tune with Ellen and laugh at the jokes and just have high energy. And so they've got like a, a DJ and they're, they're playing just music to get people like just alive and kind of dancing. And I was not knowing like any cameras were, were rolling at all. I was just gooning out, um, you know, just dancing like a buffoon and being a fool. And, um, and then all of a sudden they, 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 during the show, um, she, Ellen's coming up in the crowd and asking different people. I don't know what, I can't remember what she was doing. And then she like pulls me up. And she's and she had mentioned something along the lines. Can you go ahead and show us what we saw backstage before this show started? And then they started the music. And like, yeah, I guess I got to go ahead and uh, start dancing and and uh, rip my shirt off and and you know go for it. Yeah, dude, that was that was so cool to be able to see. And again, that's just another one of the things that James asked you about, right? Like maybe in that situation you think uh no thanks this is uncomfortable this is weird this is on television like i'm just going to do a little bit of what i did but you really went for it you yeah. know and who knows who who could have been watching that and who saw it and you know that she would remember that like that was mm. such a cool such a cool thing um, yeah. and that you figuring out how to stand out you know what i mean in a in a group of i don't know how many people are there you know 50 100 something like that in it was the same way in, in professional football and, you know, in the NFL and in college football, you've got to do things to stand out. Right. So like, what else are you able to do? Like you mentioned, walk on set, people see your big, strong guy. What are things that you do or that you try to do intentionally that help you kind of stand out from the crowd to be able to get some of these, these bigger roles and be able to get the opportunity, right. To, to start for the, the Oakland Raiders and, and all those kind of things. What are, what are some of the things that you try to do to, to make yourself stand out? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think um, really like leaning into the strengths that you have and understanding, yeah, those places that you do stand out and, and where you excel and leading with those. Um, so for me, I'm really, I'm good with comedy. I'm athletic. Um, you know, I, I lead with a lot of those things. Um, it, even in audition sometime, maybe I'll like throw a backflip in there or something, whatever, just to show, because if it's going to be a physical role, you just, you want people to know that, or I'll send a, an athletic reel along with the the audition or uh, things like that. Um, and also just, I think, um, you know, being able to to work really hard is is a skill. And, and so coming in there and, and just um, being humble and just loving everybody around me and, and working really hard um, that, that gets noticed uh, more so over time than anything else. And people really respect that, especially if you um, attack it every day like that. Like, you know, the, 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 the parallel would, in football would be like, there's just one day that all of a sudden one of the scout teamers decides to go hard, but he's been dogging it every other day before that. I and mean, these guys are like, get the hell out of here, you know, know your role. But if all of a sudden he had a click in his mind and he, he went hard that day, and then the next, and then the next, and th for the rest of the season, he's got everybody's respect. You know, um, I've always respected, I've, and I'd seen that happen several times, especially throughout college. Just guys like I'm, I'm sick and tired of being on the scout team. I'm, I'm gonna start getting after it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start hitting these guys and guys. You know, you end up getting in fights because these these guys that are playing and beat up during the season, they tired of this scout team guy going hard on them. Um, and they, they deal with the fights and they, they bring it the next time and the next time. And after a while, people just start getting worn down. They're like, yeah, this is, this is how this guy's going to be. That's just what it is. I respect it. Um, yeah. So kind of looking back and bringing it back to your college football <laughs> days, we, we talked about there were two years where the program was just kind of so-so. 
you guys weren't winning a lot of games. Then you get a new system, a new coach in, and things started to shift around. It was pretty tangible, or you could feel the difference being on those two different teams almost. Um, and then having, you know, non-successful seasons and successful seasons. Is there anything similar to that when you've been on different sets with different productions where you can kind of feel there's this culture that like, this is a really good opportunity where I feel comfortable performing and, and being on set. And then have you been in situations that aren't the same? Is that, is that a similar thing in, in that industry? Yeah, I think with any team or any production or any organization really a the company or, or the uh, the players, they're an extension of the leader. And so leadership was always the biggest thing, uh, especially when we had Coach Hope come in in, in college. Like he, he made it like a fraternity in some sorts. It's like we, this is a brotherhood and created tradition. He, he gave us all these things to really buy into or get out on. And um, I've noticed that on sets too. Um, you know, if, if like the lead actor is a jerk, you know, it's a much more hostile, just volatile set. Um, people don't, they're, they're kind of walking on eggshells or, if, you know, the director is that way or something. Uh, people don't feel as safe, maybe like in the performance to really put themselves out there, take chances. They're worried about getting yelled at. It doesn't lead to the most creative environment. Um, and so I would say definitely one of the bigger things is just the leadership. Who, who's at the top and how are they um how are they, you know, leading? Because everybody's kind of leading by example in some ways and um, actions speak louder than words and, and uh, I can lead to a great set or, or a not great one. What are some of those leadership qualities that that you've noticed from Coach Hope that transferred over to the leadership qualities of some of the, the people that you've been working for on, on set? Yeah, I think, I guess when I think about it, it's just, Think more in feelings almost like um he just really he really took control and was a very um authoritative in some ways and, and it was like buy-in everybody has to buy in but everybody completely respected him too he just took it very seriously he he, he walked what he was what he was preaching to us you know and he really cared about that team it wasn't just you know about him and his career and, and um and you can feel that you can feel that passion, I guess, is what it is. You know, somebody's very, very passionate. Um, it can't be faked. It's felt. How about your leaders when you were in Oakland? What was your time like there? Yeah, I went through um, probably three head coaches in my time there. Um, started it was De Dennis Allen, who uh, had drafted me. I think that was his first year as a head coach uh, with the Raiders in 2012. And then halfway or maybe a few games into the 2014 season um we had a, he was fired and we had an interim head coach um tony sperano uh rest in peace and um you know every every leader leads in a, a little bit of a different way but they all have you know they all had great things about them and, and things you take from them um but it was just it's it's been a revolving door in, in that organization for man, a couple of decades it's it's uh we're hoping we get it right this time <laughs> still and so still cheering for him still love What's him, that right? still cheering for the raiders still oh yeah him. man that's my team that was one of the blessings of, of spending my whole career my my short career um all with one team is um there's no divided loyalty that's my team What's wild is is being from Sacramento. I went to more Raider games growing up than any other team. Even though San Francisco was close too, I went a couple of those. But um, there's something different about you know just going to a game in the black hole and seeing these guys come out the tunnel is a different energy, man. Oh, I bet. Um, let's let's talk about people. Maybe listening might think, okay. Miles had success at the high school at the high school level, enough to have success at the college level, had success at the NFL level, had some injuries, right? Little bump in the road, and then has had this career in acting. It sounds like a pretty linear, pretty simple path. I'm sure there are things that have happened. You had mentioned, you know, one day kind of hanging out on the couch, not being in a great mind, mindset. Also, you mentioned the injuries a little bit. What are some of the other bumps in the road or resistance that you felt and had to overcome to be able to get to where you're at now man so much still going through them that's usually all all up here all, all in the head um 
Man, that's a it's a good question. I don't even know how to put it into words. That's exactly. a great point too. Like a lot of it is not what's out in front of you. A lot of it's here. I heard Will Smith say something on an interview recently where he said, you know, 99% of the things you're scared of don't come true, mm -hmm. but we spend so much time worrying about these things that we don't ever get to get out of that and into a place that we feel comfortable and, and inspired and driven to pursue things. Cause we're always so concerned with what's happening right now and what, you know, what the worst case scenario would be. So yeah. I'm sure there's plenty of times during auditions. I know there was in the film room, right? If you do one thing wrong and coach circles you with the laser, I remember thinking even in college, like, oh, I'm gone. Like there's going to be a yeah. meeting after this that they're going to cut me. Mm -hmm. you know? And then you get to professional football, same thing, but even at a higher level. Oh no, now he's calling me out in front of it. Uh, you know, I just made this one mistake, right? What's the worst thing that can happen? And that can really ruin a day that can ruin a week that can ruin a couple weeks, especially if there's something that you do on a bigger stage, right? Yeah. If you play the game, Oh, all these people saw now these other coaches are going to remember these things. Right. And I think a lot of our athletes that we work with, same thing, right? It's, you know, I, uh, I'm only throwing 80. I need to throw 85. And if I don't throw 85, my career's over and I'll never get an opportunity to play baseball again and all, but 99% of all of these things don't happen. Right. Like you said, it's up here, right? How can we kind of help, you know, the, the listeners and the, and the kids that are going through those things, how can we help them understand that it gets better? You just got to push through that, that resistance and those bumps. Yeah, no, it's such a good question, man. It, it does get better. I, I, um, I think I have one of those minds. I'm, I'm very over analytical. And like you said, like the, the progression of, if I don't throw 85 and this and that, then basically I'm going to be dead. You know, it's just like your, your mind goes through this like cycle of like worst case scenario over just the craziest things. Um, you know, and unthinkingly, like you're not even trying to create that in your head. It just goes that way. And so I think it's been helpful for me to try to identify, okay, what is it I'm, I'm, I'm feeling? Cause you know, especially as an athlete, you always feel like, man, there's always more I can do. I can always uh, I can get more in the weight room or go watch a little more film or go go throw a little more or this, that, and the other. And it, it kind of puts you in this rushed state to where I remember after I retired, I realized I've never really like spent time thinking in my life. Like I've never really thought about what I thought about or what I felt. I just, I never realized the mind body connection and, um, you know, that I have to work on my mind as much as I work on my body. I never, I just thought, no, it's all, everything's physical. It's all physical. I, I, I didn't learn how the power of the line until I was done. Cause I was always in this rushed state. And I think sports can, can give you that feeling sometimes uh, when you don't understand the full picture and how important rest is and how important it is to have balance and to, to, to manage your mind. Um, so in part of that managing your mind, it's like, okay, what, what is this feeling that I'm feeling? I'm feeling anxious, you know, like, why am I feeling anxious? Well, it's because, um, you know, I, I, I knew I messed up on that play and I've got film tomorrow and, you know, we're going to go over it in front of all my peers. I'm going to get called out and they're going to call me this, that, and the other. And, and I, I think that means that, you know, nobody's going to respect me. And, um, you know, I think that that means I'm probably going to lose my starting job and I'm a this and I'm that. And you go down and it's like, well, what else could be true? And it's like, well, you know, I think maybe everybody played a pretty poor game. We all lost. We got spanked. Other guys are going to get called that too. There's maybe going to be a little more camaraderie in there uh, because we're going through this together. Um, there's, you know, there's opportunities to get better. I see where I messed up and I can improve and actively go after those things. So there's, there's always, there's always a flip side and there's always a positive. There's two sides to everything, like even paper, you know, there's two sides to everything. And the more we focus on the negative, the less action we're going to take. But the more we focus on the positive and all the positives that can come out of every negative, the, the more excited we're going to get and the more action we're going to take towards becoming better and becoming more and having hope for the future. And when you're in that hopeful and excited and positive place, it, it's contagious to everybody around you, but also to your work ethic. You just you believe that the work you're going to put in is leading to a better future. Um, and so that, that would be my advice is really manage your mind, really think about what you're thinking about, understand what these feelings are and what the thoughts and possibly the lies that your brain is coming up with uh, behind them are, you know, write them out on a sheet of paper, 
sometimes that helps. You can see how ridiculous these thoughts actually are when you look at them. You're like laughing because you're like, man, this is wild. Uh, like this, this is not, you know, A plus B equals, this is insane. I'm a nutcase, you know, but that's, that's our brain. You know, everybody, everybody had it. And, um, you know, taking time on that is, I think is very important. Do you have things now that you wish you, you know, some of these, some of these mental techniques, um, you know, and I don't know if you do much meditating again, like uh, manifesting anything like that, but, um, gratitude was a big thing for me. I remember I, I kind of going through a tough spot in in my career, I was always playing to spite people. I was trying, I was, I was playing angry because I wanted you, whoever you is to know that I can do this. Cause you said 10 years ago that I couldn't do it. Look at me now. Right. Yeah. And then I, I remember I, I had just a, a rush of gratitude. Um, one of the first games that both my, both my niece, niece, nephew came and they saw me, they were screaming at me and they were having a good time in the crowd. And I'm like, what a cool opportunity that I, as their uncle can play on this stage for them to be able to watch and have these memories of their uncle doing these things that he really cared about. So I shifted from basically anger all the time to gratitude and that, mm. that completely changed my life. And now it's a thing we say at the end of every, every podcast is continue to practice gratitude. And if you're not practicing it, start practicing it. Right. Are there yeah. some kind of mental shifts or mental things that you have that you do now that you wish you would have done maybe back during your, your playing days? Mm. Yeah, I think I would have, um, at least had a day or a portion of one day a week where I would, would have just spent time thinking, you know, uh, I think a lot of great um, strategy can come from that. A lot of great outside the box thinking can come from that. Um, just relaxed thinking, you know, uh, some of the best ideas come to us in the shower. And um, I think that could have helped my, my football career a lot more um, and helped me to be in a lot more of a healthy place while I was, while I was playing. Um because it was, it was run by a lot of fear, really, when I was playing. It was me living my dream. But as my wife would tell me, you're, she's like, you're living a nightmare. Like, you're, this isn't, you're not enjoying this like you thought you would as a kid. This isn't what you, you thought it was going to be. And, um, and so I think that's one of them um, as another mental shift. Let me try to think here. God. Yeah, I think also, like, working on myself. Yeah, working on myself mentally and, and I'm, having a positive mental attitude and understanding um, I wish I would have known the power of that back then and how important it is to to feed my mind and keep my mind in a positive place to be able to see um, possibility um, and uh, you know because you have a healthy mind it does wonder, wonderful things for the body as well uh, I didn't understand that connection at the time otherwise I, I would have you know I would have pushed more into it you've mentioned your, your wife a couple of times, and it sounds like she's helped you a ton. Get, get yes. to the, yeah. what, what has kind of her role, I mean, for lack of a better term, been, you know, throughout your guys' relationship and, and, and through your career, man, more than I can put into words. Um, so we, we were high school sweethearts. Um, she's really like my first ever real girlfriend, sophomore year of high school. And, um, she's just an amazing woman and she, she has her master's in marriage and family therapy. She's done over a thousand hours of just, you know, working with people and, and marriages and helping people. And she just has the most, most beautiful heart. She's basically like, uh, you know, my, my therapist and my counselor, like everything. I just, I bounce off of her. If it wasn't for her, man, I'd be a, a mental wreck probably because I, I didn't have the tools or know how to sort through all this stuff going through my head, man, it's a vortex up there. And um, she, you know, still to this day constantly is, is helping challenge me as a man, um, as, you know, deepening, helping, challenging me to go deeper in my faith with God, helping me to work out all these crazy things that go through my head and, and how to make sense of them and just an amazing listener. Um, and she's a big reason for why I'm, you know, I've been able to live out dreams in the NFL and what I'm doing now is because she's, she's been a big catalyst for it, like helping me to believe in myself and being there to encourage me um, in the, you know, the giftings that I have. And she's done that for so many people too. She's, um, she's helped kick off like several different people I can think of on the top of my head right now, just living out their dreams. She's like, can just see 
the golden people and she calls it out to them and they're like oh my gosh you, you see that like i i i've always kind of kept that from everybody but that is what i want to do and then they go do it and they and it's amazing and so she's just got this uh sixth sense uh sixth sense to her and just this uh, she's just a beautiful person inside and out i'd be a different man today if it was for it wasn't for her yeah man that's awesome i got chills you mentioned in a few of those things um that's that's so great you guys have each other and mm. you realize that like yeah this this person has got to be in my in my life and my kids lives for you know forever that's that's so cool um yeah. and i never thought I, I would find that exact same thing you're thinking about and then i realized like oh i'm just been dating the wrong people then you find <laughs> one oh yeah okay now this all makes sense yeah but, you know when you know yeah that's it yeah yeah Let's talk a little bit, man, about your kind of preparation process, right? So again, we, we talk a little bit about sports and, and again, just trying to make these two parallels, right? We are confident going into game day because we've done this, this, and this, because we've watched this film, because we've gone over these reps in practice, because we've done this extra work, because we've talked to the coaches, because we've you know spent more time with our position coaches, whatever it is, we feel prepared going into a game. What now when you – first get a role and you book a role what does your preparation process look like and take us through you know in as detailed as as you would like from when you see this role you book this or even you know if you want to even before that kind of going into the audition what's the preparation look like from that time to when you get on set and you're able to really let this character live through you yeah no, that's a good question i i have a process and I don't, you know, it's, it seems like it changes every time. Um, because the goal I would, I would say is that I can read the scene and kind of place everybody in my head and understand, um, and just understand them. Like I, sometimes I'll read, I'll read, uh, the scene for, you know, the character that I'm auditioning for. And I'm like, I just, I know this right now. I, and it's now it's just a feeling. It's just a complete instinct. That's what I want to run on it's rare when that happens. So there's not a lot of prep that needs to be happening in that time because it's like, I just, I know how to play this character. Um, and that's always nice. It saves some time in the prep. And then there's other times where it's like, I have, I have no idea what they're looking for on this, uh, nor any idea on how I'm to bring myself to this role. And so I have a lot of techniques to, you know, that I've learned and trained on over the years to, to help me with that. But at the same time, it's like, you got maybe, you know, a, a one to you know five days to prep for a role you're not going to find a full fleshed character that you have you know starting from ground zero knowing nothing about it and you don't have it instinctually i'm not going to find that that quickly you know it's going to take some time especially if it's a film role and um you know hopefully that the months leading up to actually shooting you, you can really find it and flesh it out and kind of journal about it and pour over the script over and over again and make connections um but I would say I have, I mean, like I'm constantly making notes, like ideas that come to my, to my mind about acting, which is so subjective to every person. Um, I, I just would say to all the actors out there, be careful of any um, coach or any person that says like, this is the way that acting is. And this is the technique that you must employ. And this is how it works uh, for everybody. Um, because I've met some of the most brilliant actors and they're I'm like, what, what are you thinking about? Like on this line, they're like, honestly, like a triangle. That's how I got there. I'm like, <laughs> that works. I mean, it, it was the most amazing work I've seen in so long. And you're just thinking of somehow shapes take you to an emotional place. It's like, okay, cool. You know, whatever works for you, it is everybody's brain is wired so differently. So you can't just, especially in art, you can't just say there's one way to do it. Uh, so you, you kind of like, Kind of like Bruce Lee with Jeet Jeet Kune Do. You study every method, uh, separate the wheat from the chaff for you, what personally works for you and your skill set and the way your brain works and um, employ those techniques and rely on them, uh, especially when you can't quite get there instinctually. Do you have a role that you can think of? Let, let's, let's talk about two of them. That maybe was, like you mentioned, you, as soon as you read the script, you knew it was for you. You knew you had this, you had it figured out. You could place everybody. You could use whatever shapes you needed to, to put everybody in the right spot. <laughs> right? It, has there been a role that's been super easy to prepare for? And then on the flip side of that, what has been the hardest role 
to prepare for and and why kind of both of those both of those questions easy and and hard yeah that's a good question um i've definitely had ones that are easier um ones that i've booked but kind of fell through for one reason or another uh ones that maybe even were an audition and i just totally got it but i didn't get the role um i'd say ones that were harder to prepare for would probably let me think here when um Yeah, I'm looking, you know, if you just go to if you just go to Miles's IMDB, there's plenty of stuff up there, right? Plenty of videos. Going on. <laughs> you know, like all of these, all of these clips, and it's as I wa am watching, you know, videos in preparation, every one I watch and I'm like, oh yeah, that's and it doesn't matter the difference in the wrong. I'm like, oh yeah, that's he's got that figured out. Right. But then I yeah. think, okay, there had to be some there's no way every one you got, you thought, yeah, this is, this is, this is it. You know, we talked about Keller yeah. and, the, and the parallels between your professional playing career and now acting as a football player. It's like, oh, okay. That, that in our kind of novice minds and the listeners, novice minds of, of acting, those seem pretty easy. Right. But then you see some other, some of these other roles where it's, it's a different person and a different character and you play that just as well too. But I assume there's got to be some that, that. Yeah, it's, it's cool. It's cool to hear you say like, oh, it, it makes sense for Miles. That looks that looks normal because maybe that's what casting seeing. But there's a lot that don't feel like I fit right into it. And probably, probably right now, even Triple H. Like right? I'm, I'm doing a lot of work right now of just trying to hone in on some of his his uh, mannerisms, like his speech cadence. Um, you know, especially in this in the Young Rock show, there was a lot of. Um, people really having to dive in on, on specific ways of different characters speaking and, and Triple H doesn't have like a very pronounced speech pattern, but there, you know, there is one, he doesn't like have a heavy accent from, you know, some, some place like the Iron Sheik, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I, it was, an, it was interesting because I remember getting the audition for it. First one I got for Young Rock. Well, a little prior to auditioning for Triple H, they gave me one for, for Stone Cold and I, I denied it. I'm like, I'm not going to get the Stone Cold one like that. I'm, I'm not a good fit for that. And um, my buddy Luke Hawks actually booked that one and, and uh, we met on set. He's, a, he's He is a pro wrestler and he, he's killing it. He does amazing as Stone Cold. But then I got the Triple H one and I remember thinking like, man, I don't, I have no idea if I look anything like Triple H or because basically I knew they're, they're casting real people. They're going to look at this for like, five seconds and be like next if he doesn't look like it so i i didn't prepare for the audition that much i, I looked at it for like 10 minutes and i was like all right babe let's go shoot it real quick i did it in a couple takes and sent it off because i knew like i could prepare this for hours and hours and hours and maybe get it five to ten percent better but they're going to look at it for five to ten seconds and either be in or out you know uh based on the look um and then i you know the next day or so they're like yeah we want we want you for it um but yeah, on set, it was like still trying to like work out, still trying to work out the character a little bit where you have to play to a real person um, and, and try to do justice to, some, you know, for somebody and knowing that they may watch it and, you know, I hope you don't blow it. Yeah. How much pressure do you feel with this? I like yeah, oh, I didn't feel a ton of pressure with, with Triple H, but he doesn't like me. Right. It's like, hopefully he doesn't find me and beat me up. Right. Like yeah. how much, how much pressure do you feel in those situations i was we were shooting in australia for that season so i was pretty relaxed um <laughs> i was going to the beach every day i was kind of chilling um but no not a ton it was a, it was a fun set and uh i i fall into like the physical work really well that's that's really fun and so we had chavo guerrero on set who's a wwe a uh, former WWE guy and, and he's, you know, teaching us the real wrestling moves and we get to do them for the scenes and um, something about the physicality of things. It just helps me to drop into it a little more and be comfortable. Um, but yes, yeah, so a lot of, a lot of the people playing different characters were like calling the real people in real life. And I didn't do that. I don't, I don't know exactly why. I just felt like, uh, I don't know. I only got a few lines. I don't, I don't know what else it's going to talk and this guy's going to, going to bring into it. <laughs> yeah. Has there, has there been any role or film that you've done that you finish and are totally fulfilled? 
like one of those that you thought, man, that it was worth the work. I'm glad we did it. I feel great after this. Or are they all similar feelings when you wrap, you know, you're, you're happy and you, ha well, I guess you have to be happy with it. Right. Cause there's nothing, can't go back and change it, but there are any super fulfilling roles that you've, that you've had. Yeah, definitely. I think a, a lot of the time there's, there's always things that come to you after the shoot. We're like, Oh man, I should have done this or I should have made this choice or, uh, you know, turned at this moment. It just, there's, there's the ideas keep coming and you kind of think yourself, why didn't I think of that earlier? Um, but I think the, the righteous gemstones role I did, um, I was really fulfilled after, especially one of the shoots. Um, one of the episodes I had a lot of action and a lot of lines in and, um, uh, just got to showcase a lot of different talents I had, you know, as far as, you know, do, being able to be still and have a little more rooted and grounded performance, but then also it had some like wildly comedically over the top pieces as well. And, um, I was at the time working on a lot of like, <laughs> in my own time, like flips and aerial type of things. Cause I wanted to be like a, a big guy in the industry, you know, the, with a big body, like Arnold, but be able to move kind of like Jean-Claude Van Damme and I want to be able to do be this kind of like physically you know just walking anomaly and walking anomaly in, in a sense because I want to do some action films and so I was able to find several pieces throughout that episode where you know I'm doing a, a backflip or an aerial or a kip up or things like that and actually was able to showcase in um in actual tv series as opposed to just putting it on like an athletic reel which was what I was initially thinking I was like man this is this is awesome um so I felt really good about that going home um, where I was able to make a lot of choices. Um, and then, you know, working with Adam Devine, you never know exactly where he's going to go on a scene sometimes, especially at the end, after we hit our lines, he might just throw you a layup and be like, what are you going to do with it? You know? And, and so you have to riff, you have to be prepared to kind of riff a little bit. And I remember thinking afterwards, man, I really riffed a lot, you know, on, on some of these scenes. I wonder if they were like pissed with me, you know, like who's this guest star, recurring guest star coming through, like, you know, stepping on toes or doing too much or whatever. Uh, but then I saw the final cut and they kept like three lines of mine that I just improv in a moment and just came up with. And in the final edit, so I, I think they were pretty happy with it. And also that, yeah, that same shoot was probably one of the cooler moments in my acting career because we were rehearsing a scene and at the end of the scene, Adam Devine kind of went off script and like threw me a layup. Like I was saying, I think he was like, you know, you know, Jesus carried this cross 2000 feet. You know, you only have to carry it from here to there. What do you have to say about that? And I, <laughs> and I just, it, it was the rehearsal. I just was like, Oh, I guess I have to say something to Jesus Christ bench press 455 pounds. And Danny McBride like keeled over just laughing, like started howling. And I was like, man, I just made Danny McBride laugh. That's that's definitely the coolest thing that's happened in my career so far. Oh, <laughs> and so they kept that in the edit. Dude, as soon as you said it, I bet James and I did the same thing and everybody listening are like, what would I say, right, in this situation? <laughs> like, oh, shoot. And I'm sure James didn't say, well, can he bench press 455 pounds? I mean, you're James, I know you're close to that, but. Yeah, you what know, are you benching, James? Uh, not much these days. I'm throwing a lot of baseballs. Uh -huh. Throwing a lot of baseballs okay. these days. Yeah, you gotta keep that shoulder mobility. I, see. I can I can lunge a lot though. That's all I need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not a big bench guy. I'd say I'm. I'd say yeah, I'm, you guys are big lungers, huh? I've seen videos. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah we love such a great lunges. athletic movement. Yeah, big. And it's funny because it was one that I was so resistant to for so long. Every time it was in a program, yeah. I would either do it with five or ten pound plates in my hands, or I'd look around and be like, oh, "I'll just check it off." <laughs> <laughs> I think I've since made up for that. And the big thing was, you know, short shorts started coming back a couple of years ago. And I thought, bro, I cannot have these tiny quads. If short yeah. shorts back. And so here we are now with a little bigger quads from, from those lunges. Yeah. Um, thighs, lunges, thighs of the new okay. biceps, you know, they are. I've heard that on several occasions. I'm still resistant towards that <laughs> because I'm retired and I don't like to squat and lunge, but you got to do it. Yeah. Bro, what, what does your training look like? now because you know you know you'd mention you play some bigger stronger roles especially playing triple h it's like all right you got to go toss some weight around but what what's your training look like for you know for life now that you're post post nfl career and, and into the acting stuff yeah so i've always been a big weight room guy i've always just loved lifting weights um had some great role models growing up that, that got me in the weight room um 
at a young age, I've been crush, crunching after the weight since probably freshman year of high school. Um, so as soon as I bought a house, uh, the first thing I did was put a put a uh, put a rack in there and some adjustable dumbbells and just created a, my own garage gym. And that's like my haven now. But I'd say my my routine is always constantly shifting based on, you know, if I read a different article or of a, of a new split or, a, you know, different exercises, just whatever gets me excited and motivated to try something new. I'm always just kind of guinea pig, guinea pigging myself and trying new things. But right now, um, essentially, I'm doing a uh, push day, a pull day, a legs day, and then kind of like an arms and shoulders day. And then just some odds and ends, like hit the calves or different different body parts. I need a little extra volume on on that day. Um, and then I'm going to be getting back into the martial arts again, doing Muay Thai and uh, uh, start doing some jujitsu. Um, so that'll you know I'll do that two to three days a week, um, and that's that's kind of what it looks like. But for the legs, I'm I'm big on the Bulgarian split squats as far as like a traditional lift, and then you know go, going a little heavier on those, but um not big on like squatting super heavy anymore i was a big squatter back in the day um but i you know i just so much injury risk with the lower back and uh, my knee and everything like that so i'll do the bulgarians and then i kind of do a lot of the uh, knees over toes guy for the rest of the legs um so i don't need them to be um uh, you know big tree trunks anymore but i want to stay functional and be able to jump and run and change direction and do the things that sometimes i have to do on set um, but then as far as the upper body, I'm, you know, I'm still cranking away and you got to keep that big. It's more aesthetic now than anything else. Yeah, that's it. You, yeah. And you kind of answered this question already. I'm interested in where the kind of new skill development falls into place. You said, you know, the jujitsu and the Muay Thai stuff a couple, couple times a week. Is that how you've been as you've progressed some of these skills, these kip ups, these backflips and, and things like that? Do you just kind of cycle it in or do you spend a whole day? diving into something what's what's your kind of skill acquisition process look like yeah a lot of the flipping stuff came when i was younger um when i was really into the martial arts and i was really into ninja turtles and power rangers and seeing these guys flip around i would just mess around on the lawn um and so i've been able to kind of main, maintain the movement patterns of those and maintain you know do a, i'll do a backflip maybe every couple every other month or something just to keep the skill but um yeah, the, the martial arts is definitely a new skill. Um, and so, yeah, just just drilling that at the gym, you know, the training, the MMA gym, and then I'll, you know, shadow box on my own and just try to dial in the different, you know, punches or techniques that they're showing me. Um, and then sometimes, like, with an aerial, like, I, I learned an aerial about a year ago. I just went on a bunch of YouTubes and practiced out in the backyard on the lawn and, and, until I could kind of get it. And, um, yeah, most of the learning right now though, is, is more geared towards like the screenwriting and the creative and things like that. But I, I definitely have big, um, physical goals as far as I'm trying to, you know, get, you know, certain body parts measurements up or get my weight to, you know, 245 solid in the morning. And, um, you know, while at the same time progressing in the martial arts and things. Awesome. Yeah. Do a couple, couple more things I want to, I want to hit on, um, you know, in regards to all that stuff, but there's people listening who think, you know, who, who, who could be, you know, in the, in the place that you were at early in your career, you know, obsessed with football, wanting to play football, wanting to play whatever their given sport is. Right. And, but then listen to you and think, okay, I'm going to have to, at some point, right. This is going to end. And I'm going to have to transition to something else. Do you have advice for any of these individuals who you know are so into or obsessed with something right now but understand that they've got to kind of build some more skills for for once the sport is done um you know is there anything from your career that you can look back on and, and say man i wish somebody would have told me i should have done this earlier i should have done this more um you know it just are there pieces of of advice that you can you can give to some people who want to follow in similar kind of in a similar path yeah yeah absolutely um we touched on some of it earlier with the, you know, following that collision between your gifts and talents and the things you have great passion for and a great desire for. Um, and I think another piece of it is just understanding that we all have a limited perspective. And um, for me with the, you know, the transition, getting that vision, transitioning from football to acting and think I, I used to believe that I could only have one dream for my life. I, I, 
tried to make football last as long as I could. And I was so devastated when it ended because I really believe I'll never have a vocational passion like that ever again. So that I've got to make this last. Um, but now, so I used to believe you could only have that one dream and then the rest is kind of downhill. But now I know that there are multiple dreams you can have for your life. You can go from dream to dream and, and thing you can change and the things that you desire can change. And, um, you have every person has so many different abilities and so if you can just see outside of that limited view of it has to be this one thing you'll you'll be able to see man i can do this and that and the other and hope is alive man anybody that has a propensity towards something that has a talent with something like you can you can take that a, a long ways if you really believe you can mentally and you're willing to put the work in to do it um so lead with that, you know, find out what, what you're good at and what you love doing and, and find, um, you know, jobs or areas that where those things would be valuable in. Awesome. And what, what do you see as being next for Miles Burris, right? You're doing all this stuff, dude. You've had, you've lived two amazing lives that, you know, people would love to pursue and people would love to do what, what in your mind is, is next for you? Um, this, the screenwriting. Um, so I'm going to begin pitching out, um, one of my screenplays pretty quick here and, um, uh, obtain some literary representation. You know, I got it for the acting and, and things like that, but to get a uh, literary rep and, uh, to start slinging these, these screenplays, man. And, um, and just opens up a new lane in the same entertainment industry that I'm in. Um, so I'm really excited for that because that's been, three years in the dark room, just, just cranking this writing out to where I feel like I've got at least one or two that are, that are polished enough and, and ready enough and have been through enough revision to put out into the world and see, see where it lands. And if not, then I'll get back to the grind grindstone and, and uh, make the changes and fix stuff up and, and, and keep going for it. Do you have any interest in getting behind the camera? I mean, besides the writing stuff, or is it? Yeah, is that yes, that's actually the other piece. I'm glad you said that. So I, I just um, opened up a new escort out here in Tennessee. It's uh, to eventually have a production company, um, and it's called Hope Driven Entertainment. So I want to start producing films out here that you know people can watch the film, and 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 the takeaway there is that they're going to feel you know a little more hopeful about life. They're going to feel like, man, I can I can really do this thing. Um, yeah, that's, that's the, the grand vision there is, is getting, being able to kind of do it all to, to act, to write, to produce and direct and uh, just create some of the, my own stories and, and uh, make a contribution to the world in that way. Yeah, man. Heck yeah. Well, we always wrap up with this and it, it comes <clears throat> from a place to where, you know, let's say we have a strength and conditioning coach and we say, if you were speaking to a thousand strength and conditioning coaches and you said one thing that you think we're missing in the strength industry, right? For you, I'm interested when it comes to acting and when it comes to performing, are there things that you see on a daily basis where you think, man, you know, people are falling short of this, whether it be, you know, training, whether it be preparation, whether it be mindset, is, is there something that you see missing in your niche that you think if people were to hear this and then start using it right now, that it would help them you know, further their career in, in performance and in acting? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll have the best answer right in this moment, but um, I think I touched on it a little bit earlier, just maybe from the acting perspective of, um, you know, coaches teaching in too much of like a metaphysical way as opposed to just a practical. And so sometimes you have to take and find the practical on your own. Like, hey, this thing works for me really well. Nobody else might understand it, but I get it. And I'm gonna run with that. I don't need somebody else's approval, you know, on on my technique to to have a great performance, you know. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that might be the best answer I've got in this moment. Yeah, bro. And I, I think that's a great point because, you know, in sports, people, get elite at their individual sport by doing certain things. And we see it too in training all the time is people, you have to back squat. You got, if you don't back squat, you're never going to be a good athlete. And then you get, yeah. a, you get an athlete there who can't back squat the bar, but he can 360 windmill dunk between the legs and plays in the NBA. And it's like, well, what do you say to that guy? Right. Yeah. Look in the acting world. I, you know, one of my favorite actors um, kind of probably number two, right behind miles Burris is. <laughs> 
right? And he is he who? About Shia LaBeouf. Oh yeah, he's, he always watched, he's like, dude, I didn't ever do anything. No classes, no anything, and he's had success. Then you listen to some other people, and it's been decades of of work with coaches in practice, and and that's where they have success. And so I think it's, I mean, you, I think you hit it on the head, right? It's just like do what you love to do, be so passionate about it that you can't think about anything else, and then figure out what works best for you, and do that, and and ride that thing out, and and see what happens. I mean, I think you you brought up great points and talked about it throughout the you know throughout the whole time, just like follow your heart and. You even named your your company. You said hope, hope driven, entertainment. Yeah, entertainment, right? I mean, it's like that's that's it, right? Have a dream, and and dream big and pursue that. Where can people find you if they want to see more, man? You know, not only on on TV and movie, but uh, want to find your social media and things like that. How can people find you? How can people, you know, look up your stuff? Yeah, I gotta get, I gotta start getting more active on social media. I've been thinking about that lately. Um, I'm at Miles James Burris uh, on Instagram. Uh, actually, just started a, a TikTok too at Miles James Burris. I haven't posted yet. I'm trying to figure this TikTok thing out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what else am I on? What are the other ones? I think that's that's mostly it, right? What are the other social media? Twitter, Twitter I'm at Miles Burris. I'm, not, I'm hardly on any of them, but I got to get more active and it's thinking about messing around with it a little more. You know? Yeah. And, and we'll link all your, you know, we'll link your Instagram stuff. Cause again, like just, I, I think anybody should just look into that before getting into this conversation. So it makes the connection. But, oh, like triple H. Oh, Keller. Oh, you know, these, these certain, these certain rules. And then it, and it makes it a little, you know, connects it a little more to them as they, as they listen to this and as they, as they watch this, but dude, thanks so much for coming on, man. This is, this has been awesome. We've been waiting to see your you know, we've been waiting to see your son run out here. You know, I know. He's, <laughs> my wife's been keeping him upstairs. It's probably better because once he's in here, he's in here. You're going to have 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, okay. And and I I don't want to forget this question because I think this is a great one. And, and you know, it's something you learn every day. Are, are there things that you've learned about yourself and, and what are they since you've become a father? Yeah, great question. Um yeah, I just I, I love kids. I really love kids. Um, yeah, I love my kids, but it's just great. It's it's helped me to remember just kind of that the magic of being a kid and uh, being able to see his brain, my my son's brain light up over the most like seemingly insignificant things to me, but it's all new to him. It's all novel. Um, and just yeah, I feel like God's given me more of a heart for kids, and I've started serving in the kids ministry in my church, and just very fulfilled by that and filled up by it and. Um, Man, it's been it's been a blessing beyond words, really. Well, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Thanks, bro, for your time. Thanks for thanks for sharing all this. And you know, we will send people to your Instagram, send people to your IMDb, go to Disney Plus, subscribe, you know, see see safety and and all the other films we've been involved in. Dude, we're stoked to see what else, you know, comes from this in the future. Cause I know James and I'll be laughing about this episode in a year and it's you know, watching we'll go to the theater and watch to be like yeah. <laughs> Five cut off the coffee, baby. So <laughs> thanks for well, taking dude. time. Man, thanks for yeah. thanks for coming on. Thanks for wearing the cutoff and embarrassing James and I and forcing us to go back <laughs> to the, to this evening. Um, I'm gonna bench just today. coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna yeah. bench and hit shoulders well, today. <laughs> Thank you, CT. Thank you, James. I appreciate y'all having me on and uh even thinking of me for this. It's an honor to uh to be considered forward and, and to be able to just spend an hour with you and hang out and, and talk talk good stuff man sip some coffee get super jacked and you know now i'm gonna go take a bunch of pre-workout and just sit around you know <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's <laughs> one of my favorite things just get super sucked up just to kind of sit on the couch <laughs> just write it out yeah, yeah, yeah and write right like with your handshake <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yo thanks for everybody who's made it this far man this has been episode 55 of cutoffs and coffee we ask you to do three things at the end of every episode. And we've touched on, uh, you know, two of them. Number one, it's continue to practice gratitude. Number two, tell the people that you love, you love them as often as you can. And number three, Miles mentioned it, man. Live this life stimulated. We only got one of them. Might as well live it stimulated. Thank y'all. We'll catch you guys on the next episode.